Oh, yes, give him a big hand clap and you be seated. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know that prayer changes things. Amen. How many believes that tonight? Amen. To God, if you need a healing, prayer changes things. If you need deliverance, prayer changes things. Amen. I, we call in the Word of God, I believe it is in 2 Kings chapter 20, amen, about the man Hezekiah, the Bible says, was sick, amen, unto death. In fact, the prophet came to him, Isaiah, and said, O king, set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Amen. A proclamation, amen, given by the unction of the Holy Ghost to the man of God, amen, direct from heaven. And he went in and he delivered the message. He said, Hezekiah, he says, set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Amen. And the Bible says, amen, that Hezekiah turned to the wall. Amen. And wept sore, the Bible says. And he began to cry out in prayer. But I'm telling you, prayer is the key, amen, to getting a miracle from God. Amen. Prayer is the key to getting your healing. Amen. He said, I beseech thee, O Lord, how that I have walked perfect and upright before you. Amen. And he did. Amen to God. And he sought God with tears. Amen. And but I'll tell you, prayer began to move heaven. How many knows that prayer moved heaven? Amen. And the Bible said before, oh, Isaiah got out to the middle court. Amen. That the voice of the Lord spoke to him. He said, Isaiah, go back and tell my king. I've seen his tears. I've heard his prayer. And I'm going to answer his prayer. Amen. He's not going to die. Amen. Because he prayed. But I'm going to add 15 years to his life. And he did. And that ain't all I'm going to give him to victory and deliver his enemies into his hands. I'm telling you that prayer changes things. James said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, or it produces much. Amen. God is a prayer ancient God. How many is glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. I feel good in the Lord tonight, don't you? He's such a wonderful God that has blessed us to be in His presence and in His house. Amen. Just one more time as we stand. Amen to the reading of God's Word. We will be reading from the book of Joshua, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1 down through verse 3. And the Bible says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Say man as you be seated. I want to title my message tonight, Bringing Down the Walls. Say man. Bringing Down the Walls. Amen. And I want you to understand, and many of you already do have experience in this walk with God. Amen. That the walls that I'm talking about tonight is somewhat spiritual. Amen. To us, the church of the living God. Amen. But I want you to understand whether you're young in this or middle-aged in this or elderly in serving the Lord, you understand that there's many, many walls that we have to face in this life. Amen. I'm telling you that the devil is see to it. Amen. That sometimes, amen, there'll be a wall. Amen. Just spring up out of nowhere in front of you. Amen. As a hindrance. Amen. To stop you in your your tracks. Amen. But how many knows tonight that it's no time to stop? Amen. But buddy, it's time to gear up. Amen. And march on for the Lord. Amen. 
I'm here to tell you that we serve a God, amen, that if you will trust in Him, I don't care if your wall is sickness, I don't care if your wall is disease, I don't care if your wall is affliction, amen, we serve a God, amen, that is able, amen, to bring down every wall. Somebody say every wall. Amen. I don't serve a God that sometimes he can and sometimes he can't. But I serve a God that he can do it every time. Amen. If we believe in him. Amen. So whatever. Amen. The wall is that you're facing in your life. I'm telling you it's not so great. Amen. That our God. Amen. By his power and by his anointing. Amen. Cannot bring down that wall. Listen to what he promised the man Joshua in Joshua 1, 3 through 5. Listen to what the scripture says. Now Moses, one of, if not the greatest prophet that we'll ever read of in scripture, was dead. He went on to his reward, as they say. And God was going to fill his shoes with a man by the name of Joshua. And Joshua was going to lead these people, amen, from that barren wilderness that they had wandered in 40 years into the promised land. Now listen to what the Lord said to Joshua in verse 3. Every place I feel the Holy Ghost. See, the devil wants you to doubt God can't go everywhere. God can't do everything. Amen. But I'm here to tell you, amen, that the Scripture said to Joshua, every place, it don't matter if it's in the valley low or if it's in the mountain high, but every place that the sole of your foot, amen, shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. So I want you to understand, don't let the devil limit your God. Don't let him tell you that God can do this, but I really don't know if he can do that. Because I'm here to tell you that God can do this and that. Somebody say this and that. Amen. Not just that or not just this, but I serve a this and that God. Amen. He's an every place God. He's an everywhere God. And He's an all things God. Shout amen. Verse 4 says, From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun. In other words, Joshua, as I promised to my servant Moses, the same promise is handed down to you. Amen. Everywhere that you're willing to place your foot upon, and as far as the eye can see to the going down of the sun, he said, I have given it to you. And the whoo, glory to God. There is no boundaries on God. There is no limits to what God can do. See, if the devil would have us believe it, he would have us already have KB in the grave. Because here several months or years so ago, amen, he's over there taking treatments, amen, diagnosed with cancer, and no doubt the devil trying to place doubt in people's minds, amen, but I'll say every place, amen, he's a this and that God. God, amen, and look at him now, he's in the house of the Lord at 80 some plus years. Don't tell me that God can't do it. I'm telling you that God is able. Amen. Just as sure as he sent Isaiah back to Hezekiah and said, you tell him. Amen. Because he turned to the wall and he wept sore and he prayed unto God and said, I beseech thee, O Lord, how that I have walked perfect before thee and with an upright heart. 
I'm going, woo! I'm going to, I feel the Holy Ghost, don't you? I'm going to heal him. Huh? I know I said I'm going to kill him, but now I'm going to heal him. You didn't hear what I said. Now the Lord sent Isaiah to Hezekiah and said, You tell him to set his house in order, for thou shalt thou not live. That's killing him to me. Huh? You tell him I'm going to kill him. But buddy, prayer changes things. You see, he turned to the wall. That wall of death that had overshadowed him. And he believed God. And he cried out to the God that he believed that was able, amen, to bring down the wall. And bless God, when he began to pray, God began to hear. And heavens began to move. And he healed him, Sister June, and added 15 years unto his life. I'm telling you, and he said, Joshua, I know maybe a lot of people say, well, you just think the preacher Moses was. I want to first say that about the next one that sits in my place. Well, you just think the preacher Ron was. <laughs> Pat myself on the back. Huh? Don't you dare tell nobody that steps in my shoes. Man, there'll probably be ever a bit of more to preacher than I am. I'm telling you, amen, that Joshua, amen, was a great man of God, amen, that stepped into the shoes of Moses, amen, and he never turned to the left, and he never turned to the right, and he took them cross joy right on over into, amen, the promised land, and buddy, he began to drive out the inhabitants there from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. Not the Arabs, not the Muslims, not the Islamic extremists, ISIS, not the Persians, or the Iranians, not the Magogites or the Russians, but he said, I'm going to give it, amen, to you. It's your land, amen, I'll give it to you. And watch what he says in verse 5. There shall not any man say any man. Huh? I don't care who he is, Joshua. I don't care how many he is. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee. Now notice this last phrase in this scripture. He said to Joshua, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. That's the Old Testament teaching, ain't it? But it sounds familiar to me in the New Testament. Oh, glory to God. In the New Testament. I'm going to tell you something. His word is good down from generation to generation to generation. Amen. And what he done for Joshua... He'll do for me. Amen. What he done for Moses, he'll do for you. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things that you have. Well, listen to this. For he has said, he already said it. When did he say it? Back in Joshua 1 and 5. And you're a smart group of people tonight. Oh, glory to God. Ain't that where he said it? I just read it to you. Joshua 1 and 5. He told Joshua that many thousand years ago, if you walk right, if you look right, if you dress right, I'll never fail you. I'll never forsake you. And then he comes right on over into the New Testament and says, let your conversation be without covetousness. And be continued with such things as you have. For he has said, past tense, I will never leave thee, no, 
nor forsake thee. You're not alone tonight. I don't care how dark your valley is. Amen. Or the depths of your trouble. You're not alone. They sang the song sometimes. Misty does. Just ride out your storm. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel like shouting. Woo! Glory to God. I'll break loose here and run the minute. Huh? You don't want to run, do you? Man, we come here to have a good time in the Lord. Huh? Look at your neighbor and say, honey, if you feel like running, you ought to run. Come on now. Amen. If you feel like running, you ought to run. If you feel like shouting, you ought to shout. Glory to God. I'm telling you, the walls of Jericho didn't come down until the people began to shout with a loud voice. Sometimes, sometimes, man, you just got to shout. Man, I ain't never run in my life. Maybe that's the reason why you're stuck in the place you're stuck in. Huh? Maybe you're just going to have to run your way out of it. Huh? Oh, not me, preach. I'm just not the running kind. Oh, glory. So, verse 6, that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. <laughs> Somebody say the Lord. He's my helper. He's my way, my truth, and my life. He's my healer. He's my El Shaddai. He's my Jehovah Jireh. Amen. He's my high tower. He's the horn of my salvation. He's my bright and morning star. He's the lily of my valley. Amen. He's my love. And he's my life. Amen. And everything that I have is because he gave to me. Amen. As I said before, if I preach good, it's because he preaches good in me. Huh? And if you sing good, it's because he sings good in you. Amen. If we holy, it's because of the holiness, amen, that we get from him. Shout amen. Paul said that we may boldly say, the Lord. See, God wants to be recognized. God wants to be lifted up. Amen. If you've ever had a miracle, if God's ever touching your body, you need to stand up and tell the church that Jesus healed you. Huh? That, that he made a way for me. When it seemed like there couldn't be a way made, Jesus did it. Huh? Woo! And when he brings down the wall, you need to tell somebody, man, there was a wall that sprung up in front of me, but he brought it down. Huh? So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my help. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Sound familiar? Joshua, there shall not be a man stand before you. Nothing can hinder you but you yourself. Now, if you don't want to shout, honey, I could preach and my sweat drops on your head. I mean, man, if that one was shouting, nothing will. Old timers used to think it was annoying. Huh? Huh? Amen. Well, I'm not so sure they're not right. Huh? Because does not the Bible say that taken from the body of Paul, come on now, that's where we get this prayer cloth stuff at. Brother Wolver just wasn't sitting in back and Got a revelation from heaven, cut you up some square cloths and pass them out. The Bible says that taken from the body of Paul was handkerchiefs and aprons and given to the sick, and the sick was healed, and the afflicted was delivered. I'm telling you, there's power 
in prayer cloths. Man, I'm going to tell you something. We have absolutely had a silent ministry of prayer cloths for 25 years, wherein that we have sent out prayer cloths not only in this church, amen, to people scattered abroad this nation and have got reports where there have been miracles performed. Don't tell me. Man, I've had them want to mail to them. Because you know why? They work. He that glorious, let him glory in the Lord. Everybody in the house ought to have a prayer cloth in their pocket. I got one. I'd rather have a prayer cloth than a brand new $100 bill. By preaching, you can't spend that prayer cloth. That's right, money can't buy. But when I get down and out, I can reach back there, put my hand on my wallet or bill for whatever you want to call it, and paint a dime in there. I can, oh, go. I can still be healed. Amen. If there ain't a dime in my pocket, he'll still feed me a dinner. Amen. Because he said, I'll never leave you, no forsake you, but I'll go with you all the way, even until the end of the world. I wonder how many prayer cloth packing centers. Uh, you need to get your prayer call. Brother Beecher, she got one. It ought to be something personal between you and God. Amen. It's yours. Amen. It's your connection from the natural to the supernatural. When I'm driving down the road, I want to have a prayer call. Amen. When I walk in the mall, I want a prayer cloth because you don't know what time some nut may step out of the corner in the shadow of the mall with a shotgun or a high-powered rifle or a handgun and just go blazing away. Amen. I'll tell you, there's power in prayer cloths. Amen. That'll bring down the walls of the powers of hell. You better get your prayer cloth and carry it on you at all times. Now, you know I'm a pistol packing preacher now. But I'd rather have my prayer call. Huh? Come on now. If I'd have to leave one home, my pistol or my prayer call, it ain't going to be my prayer call. Amen, because I want to tell you something. Amen, I'm looking for something divine. I'm looking for something supernatural. Amen, I'm looking for something that can deliver me out of any situation and bring down any wall. You see, because as saints of God, we all face troubles and trials and those walls in all of our lives. Is that not true? David said in Psalms 34, 19, that many are the afflictions of the righteous. He could have said there are going to be many walls arise in your life, but the Lord delivered him out of them all, bringing down every wall. I don't care what it is, but if we serve a God, then that is able. And I'm going to tell you something. Amen, they're going to be there. I was thinking as I was meditating upon this message, amen, and about David, and we've heard him preach about so much, we all know the story of how that David, as soon, what was the first thing that David faced when he came out of the shepherd's field as a young lad? When his father sent him up to the battle, to see how things was going. The first thing, as a youngster, not even old enough to go to war, face was Goliath. According to biblical measurements, nine foot, nine inches tall. It don't give 
the description of David, but he was just a little old small fella. Smaller than me even. And that's small. Shout amen. Huh? They estimate, some scholars do, that he's about 16, 17 years old. We know that he wasn't old enough to go to war because he wasn't out there on the battlefield. Huh? The Bible said he was just a ruddy boy. Amen. I'm figuring he weighed about 90, 95 pounds, maybe 105. Huh? But there stood old Goliath, who had a coat of mail that weighed about 300 and some pounds. His coat weighed more than David did. Huh? And the tip on his spear weighed 15 pounds. Huh? Yes, it was. But that was the first thing that David faced when he come off the shepherd's field was this nine foot, nine foot giant armored down from head to toe, had a coat of mail, a spear, a man and a man that went before him just carrying his shield. Man, he was a brute of a wall. He was a mean looking something or other. Shout amen. Yes, he was. Amen. But here was this little old boy had nothing but a slingshot and five smooth stones. Amen. A staff. Amen. And just his regular clothing. Amen. And he looked down. But you know what David had? Maybe somewhere, somewhere in his life, somebody read to him what was said unto Joshua. Huh? You ever think of it that way? Back to Joshua 1, 3, 4, and 5. Listen again to what he said. You see, when God makes a promise, he makes it to all of his people. See, God didn't just promise to heal me and skip you. Or he didn't just promise to make a way for me and not you. Amen. The promises of God is for everybody. But there's a catch to it. He said, I knew it. Man, there's, there's a catch to everything. But I'm, I'm sorry. There is a catch to it. There was a catch to it when Hezekiah turned to the wall and wept sore. What was the catch? He said, I beseech thee, O Lord, how that I walked before thee with a perfect heart. Huh? And have done that which is right in thy sight. You see, he met the conditions of in order to get a miracle performed in his life. You see, and there is a condition. God wants you to obey him. That's the catch. Or we should say that is the key to your miracle. He said every place, maybe somebody read that to this young boy. Maybe he got a hold of the writing while out in tending his father's sheep and began to read in Joshua chapter 1 how that God said to this Joshua, every place that the soul of your feet shall tread upon, that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all to the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. And verse 5 is my point. Maybe this really hit home. You see, King Saul was literally afraid of Goliath. He refused to meet him head to head on the battlefield. David's elder brothers, who was greater in stature, more manly looking than him. How do you know, preacher? Because the Lord sent Samuel down to the house of Jesse and said, I want you to go down there. I've got me a king down there and take the oil and I'm going to let you anoint me a king. Let's read the scripture right there. And the Bible says that the preacher got his oil. Old jug of that stuff. I mean, back then when they anointed you, they anointed you. 
I mean, when they had all anointed your night, you better wear some old clothes. Because they're going to soak your head. If you had a beard, it'd run down your beard, down on your clothes, that old greasy olive oil. But that's how God said, do it. I'm not going to complain of you. But maybe either somebody rehearsed this to David, or maybe that, that he was sitting there reading, and he began to read that God promised Joshua, Thy shall not any man. How many men? Not any men. That's what God means. When he told Joshua, Brother Dixon, there shall not be any man. That's what he meant. Not a black man, not a white man, not a yellow man, not a red man, not a brown man, not any other kind of man shall be able to stand before thee. How long? All the days of thy life. Huh? Oh, David. David, somebody told him. And man, he, I don't know if they had mirrors in that day. Huh? So if we didn't have them today, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? Now, don't look at me like that. Is there one in here that did not look in the mirror before you come to church? Oh, God, I'll run in the mirror. So help me. Huh? I don't know, but he, he knew well how big he was. They probably didn't have, have no mirrors other than the reflection in the water. Maybe when he led those few sheep down at that steel waters. And he looked over in the eye, and he seen his reflection because you can't in the water. Says, hmm, 95 and gross. Huh? And then he looks out, and he sees this nine foot, nine inch giant of a man who was armored down from head to foot. Wow! But he remembered huh? the word. Whew, I feel like I'm going to cry. Like, shut up your word. When he looked down at Goliath, he wasn't seeing. The size or the weight or the armament that he was clothed in. But all was in his mind is what thus saith the word of Almighty God when the Lord said to Joshua, Thou shall not any man, Goliath, none of his brothers, or nobody else shall stand before thee all the days of thy life. And he thought within himself, if it worked for Joshua, it'll work for me. Give the Lord a big hand you have. If it'll work for Joshua, it'll work for me. I don't know how big Joshua was. David probably didn't know how big he was. And it really don't much matter when you've got him. Because when you've got Jesus, you've got everything you need. You don't need anything else. And no matter what battle that you are engaged in, there shall not any man. No wonder, old David, when he looked down there at that big old warrior that was a warrior from his youth, when he looked down, he disdained David. You see, I'm going to tell you, we do get a little bit of knowledge concerning David's appearance because the Lord actually had to warn Samuel to not look on the outward appearance. I mean, the king I got down there, he don't look like a king. He's a little bit bony. About like brown hair. I mean, he don't do a whole lot of work now. Uh, David just David just went one and felt hit way too much. See, oh David know that, see. The man that Goliath, he just uh, but, he, but, but he knew the words of God. Now, the Lord said to Samuel, I want to go down to the house of Jesse. I've got me a king down there, and I want you to anoint him. 
And the Bible says, oh, Samuel went down there. He said, Jesse, line up all your boys here. The Lord sent me down to anoint a king. Man, and they stood up there, and that eldest one, I believe his name was Eliab or something like that. And man, I'm telling you, he was, I mean, he was, they was probably all sweating. Yeah, you know how bodybuilders do, and had them all in line, and they was like this. So I think. They they trying out to be king. Man, oh Sam, yeah, that must be him right there. I mean, that, that fella got that six pack. He talking about Bud. I got a guy with Bud. When I was six pack. Well, he looked and he thought for sure, but the Lord had warned him. No, none of these. He said, but my king, he said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Because I don't care how big you are physically, I don't care how great that we think we are, in the eyes of God, we are nothing. We are a giant zero. Huh? So if anybody asks you how you rate yourself from one to ten, Zero in the eyes of God. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And tell what the Bible says. And the Lord said, None of these. And he looked around and said, Jesse, the Lord sent me down here to anoint a king. He said, Have you got any more? Son, he said, Yeah. I said, I've got one. I mean, you're going to be shocked when you see this boy. Samuel said, well, I ain't got much choice. Go get him. Well, here he come in, but just prancing around. All 95 pound of him. Arms about that big around his head. And, I, and the Lord said, there he is. Because the Bible says God looks not on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. Now, that don't mean he's clothed in some piece of twisted rag. But he's talking about, he saw, he said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart. He knew that while all of David's brothers, the rest of Jesse's sons, were upon the side of the mountain afraid to go to battle with their king and all Israel, that this little shepherd boy, Maybe it was, I don't know, but maybe it was. He knew that David was a Bible reading boy, and he read in his word where I told my servant Joshua, There shall not any man be able to stand before you. And guess what? David believed every word. You've got to believe the word of God. you got to believe it when God said he'll heal you. you got to believe it when God said he'll deliver you. you got to believe it when God said he'll make a way for you. David believed God's word. And he looked down at Goliath and he whipped out that stone and as slain. Maybe that's what he rehearsed. There shall not any man be able to stand before me. And he let it go in the name of the Lord. And the Bible says he struck him in the forehead, brought him to his knees. And David ran up and jumped upon him, took his sword out and cut his head off. Huh? All it was was a wall that stood before David. I want to tell you something. I don't know what your wall is here tonight, but God's able to bring it down. Listen to what he also said to Joshua in Joshua 1, I believe 5, 6, and 7, and 8, somewhere along there. 6, 7, and 8. But he tells him now, after he tells him that there shall not be any man shall be able to stand before him, but he said, you've got to, you, now you've got to do a little something on your own. How many knows that now? I mean, you, you've got to do, folks, you've got to do a little something. I mean, he just ain't going to let you sit on your seat, him do it all. You've got to do just a little something. I mean, if we can get just a little bit out of you, we can have a time. Uh, he said, be strong, number one. 
Joshua, he said, be strong and have a good courage when you can't be afraid. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear to their fathers to give to them. Verse 7. And he emphasizes or re-emphasizes, only be thou strong and very, notice the adjective there to courageous, and be thou not just courageous, but very courageous. I'll just leave it right there, but where we heard that before, Ephesians 6 and 10, to the church. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. See, in order to have great success, in order to have great victory, we must apply that which was applied to Joshua, amen, and to David, to ourselves. Only be thou strong and very courageous. See, the devil will make you afraid. He'll make you afraid to do there's no reason to be afraid. Man, I, I heard people say, man, you know, I, I'd like to be one of those runners around the building. But they're afraid. The devil says somebody like that. The devil says somebody like that. Huh? People laugh and they re baptize. Huh? <laughs> Maybe not me, some of you. Huh? Huh? People ain't got no business laughing at somebody worshiping God. Ain't that the truth? I mean, everybody ain't got a real free shout. Right? Huh? You see, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe. Now watch this. The catch. To your miracle, to your healing, to whatever it is that you need from God, that wall that needs to be brought down. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. That's the Bible. With Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. There's too many people going this way, and there's others going this way, and the Bible says go this way. It only works when you're going this way. It won't work going this way. And it won't work going that way. You've got to go this way. According to all the law which Moses and my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper. How many wants to prosper? Man, I do. Man, I take all you give. I'm not bumming. You want to give it away? You can grease my palm with those. Not George Washington, Jesus. He got fat on that dog on deal. You got to have one to know. Maybe right now for you, I ain't got one in. <laughs> I didn't know that it escaped me. I never had a thousand dollar deal. It's going too close to a five. I, I, I might be around up at least. Huh? I don't even know who's on 20. But listen, folks, we can't turn to the left or the right. But if you stay on the straight and narrow, that thou, Joshua, may prosper whithersoever thou goest. Verse 8, listen to what it says. This book. See, people don't think the Bible is important anymore. I mean, it's good to shout, it's good to hold it on the floor, it's good to run around the building, all those things are good. You ought to do more of it. Come on. Shout amen. But you're afraid. You're not very courageous. Uh, one of these nights, the Lord laid on my heart and said, everybody in the building is able to run. We want to run tonight. We're going to, we're going to make this church a, a corral. And we're going to be holy horses. Uh, and we're going, to, we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to ride around this ring here, around these seats here, and we're going to, we're going to be holy horses for the Lord. I wonder how many get up and go run. Huh? You see, man, you, you, it makes you feel good. It will. 
it'd get all the pride out of your life. I mean, man, it'd put a smile on your face. It'd even make some of you laugh. You'd be laughing at yourself. Pretty up there, you know, that's good. Huh? This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, he said. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. What he's saying, ladies and gentlemen, that you'll never have success, you'll never have a miracle, you'll never have that way made until we bring ourselves under subjection to the words of Almighty God. As the singular would come. Bringing down the wall. I could preach another hour and a half about Joshua and how they marched around. See, you thought I was a little bit foolish by going around this church here, didn't you? And you probably didn't think I really mean it either, did you? Huh? Now, before the walls of Jericho came down, they had to march around. Uh-huh. Yes, they did. I'm going to get you off for now, and I'm going to give you a few nights to get your nerve up. Uh, I ain't going to say why we can't say. Well, I'm going to tell you, I can trust you. Uh, if you want to bring down the wall, we must be obedient to the Word of God. And you all know the story of Joshua. God was telling Joshua, just yonder is a city filled full of the enemy. And in order to go anywhere that I told you that your feet would tread upon, to the going down of the sun, from the wilderness even to Lebanon. You've got to first bring down Jericho. And Jericho was to Joshua as Goliath was to David. His greatest challenge, and it happened at the beginning of the ministries. As soon as David came out of the shepherd's field, it was Goliath that he had to face. And as soon as Joshua came across Jordan, it was Jericho that he had to face. The most fortified city in the land of Canaan. A double-walled city. The Bible don't give the measurements, but historians and archaeologists that have uncovered the site over there believe the walls to have been the outer wall which was built upon an embankment on a hill. The outer wall being 12 foot high, approximately 6 foot thick. Then on up the embankment was another wall, a double-walled city. Some believe to be in around 45 feet high and the top 12 foot. And houses built into the walls. That's how Rahab was found. I was watching a program just the other night on the discovery of Jericho. And there was these two archaeologists way back there. And at different times, they discovered the city. And one of them, you see, they, they really didn't care about what the Bible says, but sometimes they would try to disprove the Bible. And the Bible says that Jericho's walls fell down flat, and they did, because the Bible says that it did. But you know how many is it got to prove it? Well, they proved it that it did. But on the northern corner... They found where a part of the wall was still standing. 
There is no doubt in my mind that wasn't where Rahab's house was. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. That house that had the scarlet cord hung out the window. Who made a pact with the spies of Joshua and said, we know that your God is going to deliver this place into your hand. But we want to be saved. I'm going to hide you. I'm going to protect you. But in turn, I want to be saved. And the spy said, drop her scarlet cord. That scarlet cord represents the blood of Jesus on Calvary. It's typology. You've got to have the blood. And she hung out a cord out the window. And when they marched around the city one time, on the first day, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, not opening their mouths, on the seventh day, Joshua said, as the seven priests with seven ram's horns went around first, followed by the Ark of the Covenant, followed by the rear guard and the children of Israel. He said, I want you to march around that city seven times today. And on the seventh time, I want the priests to sound the trumpet. And when they sound the trumpet, I want all of the people to shout. See, everybody's got to shout if you want to bring down the wall. And they marched around, and on the seventh time, they blast with the shofar or the ram's horns, and the people let out a shout, and the wall supernaturally began to crumble. All but that little northern portion where this harlot by the name of Rahab lived, who believed God. She believed God. And because she believed Him, God saved her. And they said, bring all into your house that you want to save. Ain't God good? Uh, go ahead and give Him a hand clap. I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care how much alcohol you've drunk. How much drugs you've taken, how much you've stolen, what sins you've committed, it doesn't matter. There's a scarlet cord you can get a hold of tonight. And his name is Jesus. We're going to have a baptism after a while. I love baptisms, don't you? You know why? Because that's what the Bible says. See, we just can't pick out the parts of it that we want. We've got to take the whole book. But in closing tonight, if there's a wall in your life, 